Good morning. Uh, people will be filing in uh, as we speak. It's still very early, but we need to get started. Uh, my name is Bishar Dumani. I'm a professor of history here at Brown University. And I'm also director of Middle East Studies. Welcome uh, to the Middle East Studies fourth annual Engaged Scholarship Conference. The theme that brings us together here this year is Brains in Crisis, Stress and Resilience in Syrian Refugee Children. Engaged Scholarship is uh, one of four Middle East Studies research initiatives that we have been pursuing here at Brown University since I joined this great community in 2012. The aim of engaged scholarship is to sustain a critical conversation among scholars from across the disciplines and area studies around the politics and ethics of knowledge production in zones of conflict. The primary questions we ask are, what questions ought we be asking, ought we to be asking? And what does it mean to put intellectual work in the service of the social good? The theme of this year's conference revolves around the Syrian refugee crisis, and in particular, its impact on brain development and mental health outcomes in young children. Our Brown-based team of interdisciplinary scholars connects scientists with anthropologists and historians, cognizant that an understanding of the historical, regional, and social context is paramount to productive scientific engagement in this crisis, which is actually the largest humanitarian crisis in the world since World War II. This past January, our team, and they'll be coming up soon to the podium, and uh, this is how we're starting our conference, so we'll uh, m share names then, uh, went on a fact-finding mission to learn about the current stressors faced by Syrian families and children in Jordan and in particular at the Zaatari refugee camp. I want to be very clear. Ours was not a research opportunity or mission. We were not there to carry out a study. Our goal, I also want to be clear actually, that ours was not about implementing any intervention. Our goal simply was to see, given our skills, expertise, and interests, if there's anything we can do to share with people on the ground the best and the most cutting edge science on the role of environmental influences on brain development and pathology, and how to best buffer these stressors in the broad service of protecting healthy brain development in this generation of children, and as you'll hear, over 70% of Syrian children were born after the conflict started in 2011. We hope that in connecting the service providers directly with the science of stress, and in particular, how to buffer its effects, we are offering an invaluable service to a global crisis. Some acknowledgments before we get started. I'd like to acknowledge President Paxson, who will arrive a little later. She'll be speaking at this conference, as well as all the, our distinguished speakers and you, the audience. This is being streamlined. We have a lot of people online now, so hello to you out there in cyberspace as well. I would like to thank the Department of Cognitive, Linguistic, and Psychological Sciences and the Brain Institute for Brains, and the Brown Institute for Brain Science, and especially its newly Appointed director, Diane Lipscomb, uh, congratulations. And Diane was there on the ground floor in our first couple of meetings of this group. The Jordan team is, I don't know if that's what we should call it, but Dima Amso, who will be coming up, Carl Saab, uh, Sarah Tobin, uh, Tala Dumani, and myself. I'd like to uh, tell them we, we were close before the trip, but I think after the trip, we're definitely a family, so um, I want to tell them how much I love them. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Middle East Studies staff, uh, especially Sarah Tobin and, uh, and Barbara Oberketter, 
who are hiding. Uh, but we really can't do anything without them. But also the Brown Events Manager, Megan Silvestri, the presidential hosts, uh, the students who have been helping you get ready and get started. And I would like to point out that this conference will take place in two venues. We'll be here until lunchtime, and then we'll resume at the Joukowsky Forum at the Watson Institute uh, for the rest of this afternoon, but also for tomorrow. Um, so I would, at this point, would like to invite the members of the first panel, our team, to come up so we can uh, get started. <coughs> So I'm speaking, can you hear me? Okay. I'm the first speaker. <laughs> I'm waiting for the PowerPoint to be start. Do I need to do it? Hello. So while, I, while this is being set up, um, I'd like to say we have a couple traditions here in Middle East Studies. One is that we don't do introductions. Uh, <laughs> we want to save time for the actual substance of the talk. So uh, you all should have received this program plus a sheet on the inside that has the names and the bios of all the speakers. Please refer to that. Uh, we will dispense with introductions. Another uh, tradition we have in Middle East Studies is that uh, we never uh, pay honorariums, especially to senior scholars. <laughs> uh, they are here for what we do, um, and I really want to thank them very much for coming here and doing this. So um, um, here we go. All right. So uh, there's this, I took this picture uh, on the outskirts of Zatia refugee camp during our trip. Um, for me, it's a powerful picture. Uh, it tells me that we don't know what the future will bring. Uh, but whatever will happen to that boy will happen to the world. We are all implicated in the Syrian refugee crisis in more ways than I recount, can recount in the seven to 10 minute intervention. And that's, the only, that's how much time each one of us will take. <clears throat> Brown University is a special place. Because of its scale, because of its uh, excellent faculty, its unbelievable students, <coughs> um, interdisciplinary work is not something we aspire to as an ideal. It's actually something we do on an everyday basis. Uh, so my meeting with Dima was not, quote unquote, accidental. Uh, nothing here really is accidental. Uh, we met at last year's uh, convocation, if actually she approached me, uh, with a question that so many of us have been thinking about since the war broke out in 2011, what, what can we do? And I would like to recognize here that Dima has really been the moving spirit behind this project. Now this question has been on my mind all my life uh, because of the field that I'm in, which is a radioactive field called Middle East Studies. Um, and so I've been, always been interested in the politics and ethics of knowledge production and what does it mean for scholars to put uh, their work in the service of the social good. So if we can pull the next slide. Sorry about that. Thank you, Tuba. Tuba has been an invaluable assistant here at Middle East Studies as well. I just wanted to show you that uh, some of the um, <coughs> uh, themes that we've had in past years, beginning the first year with how do we do field work? Uh, among people that we say that we want to be part of their struggle for social change. Uh, another one is what happens to anthropologists and archaeologists who work in zones of conflict because all their permits and their equipment and their questions really are determined by military uh, and other forces. 
Uh, last year was on sexualities and queer imagination in the Middle East, which is a, a very important topic and very controversial topic of discussion, and scholars working on that issue needed to deal with the politics and ethics of working on that topic, and this year, of course, is no less important. What brought us together here? You can move to the next slide. Um, I've been trying to think, what is it that brings somebody like Dima and myself in the same kind of intellectual zone? even though we come at it from very different vantage points. I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, that both of us in many ways uh, have always been interested in uh, erased and marginalized populations. As a historian, I've dedicated my career to studying those social places, uh, those places, social groups, and time periods have been privileged or, on the other hand, ignored by conventional scholarship on the Middle East. And I've always been interested, what are these marginalized groups doing in their daily life, and how do they shape their own future, their agency is not recognized in that sense. And I have a feeling that when one studies the causes, the complex causes of stress, and the lessons of resilience, they're also dealing with people whose voices have been erased, but who have an enormous impact on our future. I learned about epigenetics, and I sometimes wish I didn't, because it's really scary uh, to think that uh, causes of stress today can express themselves in what genes turn on and off a generation or two down the road. It makes us historians, and especially me as a Palestinian, think the Palestinians are screwed, because <laughs> they've been under stress for a very long period of time now, with one crisis after another. Um, now, why focus on kids under seven? I will not address that question. My colleagues Dima and, and Carl will, will do that, but I just want to make sure that people understand that, yes, I'm a parent. We are parents here. Some of us are potential <laughs> parents. Um, uh, and uh, we, we are incredibly, <laughs> incredibly moved uh, by, by the, the impact of this crisis on children. But that is not all there is to what we're doing. Uh, we believe that uh, what is happening now to this group will express itself in the future in ways that cannot be calculated. And that there's a real urgency to the situation. We relatively have, we have a small window, relatively speaking. And we know that many NGOs, governments, and uh, private donors are uh, focusing on all sorts of issues relating to the crisis in Syria. Uh, and we believe that children in that age group need more attention from us. So our work uh, is designed in four phases. Learn, and that's what we started doing after we met at the last convocation in September. We started meeting on a bi-weekly basis uh, to discuss all the issues. Uh, to read the reports, to Skype with people on the ground, to prepare ourselves, um, and then to go on this trip. Uh, hopefully, if this uh, conference um, does uh, lead in that direction, there'll be a phase two of design, and then provide, not directly, but through other providers, and then s hopefully scale up, because what we will learn from this conflict will be applicable, I think, to many other situations. We do have three quick challenges that I want to mention in doing this. Again, I begin with this question of what does it mean to be an engaged scholar in zones of conflict? Um, how do we uh, think about uh, engagement uh, in a way that doesn't repeat this white man burden parachuting in <laughs> and then parachuting out? Uh, and just sharing what we know. Uh, we have taken that question very, very seriously, and I, I, I believe that much of the discussion today and tomorrow will revolve around that issue. Uh, so let me repeat again. We went there asking, what questions should we ask? Um, and we wanted to be able to face another challenge. The challenge was, uh, it's one thing to put scholars from different disciplines together like in a jigsaw puzzle. It's like a positivist approach to interdisciplinary work. We know what the image later is going to be like, we know what the scale is, and we think we know who are the different kind of specialized people, and we just need to put them together to create this image that we have in mind. 
We did not want to do it that way. We believe that it's putting the cart before the horse. Uh, we wanted to start this collaboration from the ground up by asking largely epistemological questions about how we do what we do, why do we do it the way we do, and what do these approaches challenge us in terms of thinking about the very basic assumptions that we go in with and how all of that will change once we start listening to what people on the ground are telling us. Um, and in sp specifically, uh, m some of us, like Sarah and myself, are trained in the particular. We really look at the very specific circumstances and contexts of things as historians or anthropologists, whereas, for example, Diemen and Carl in many ways are trained to think in universal terms. Uh, and how to work that out together from the ground up was, in terms of these epistemological registers and approaches, uh, was important for us to discuss. And I want to mention here something that may sound esoteric, but it's not for many of us in the field. And that is we believe that are the basic analytical vocabularies that we use in the academy, uh, which is really a 19th, 20th century development of professional disciplines. Themselves were developed at a time when Europe was expanding and colonizing the world. So they are implicated in many ways in this process of uh, imperialism, of co colonialism, of uh, the creation of certain categories of race and culture and civilization and so on and so forth. And we uh, do not want our work to just take this conceptual vocabulary for granted. Uh, so we're constantly questioning the ways that we think. And finally, the third major challenge is how do we work on the ground with practitioners? people who themselves are learned, but who have a long experience of working on the ground. Um, and that is a very different tempo and attitude than many of us uh, have in the academy, at least those of us uh, who sit behind desks a lot of the time. And so we consider these three challenges as things that will be with us uh, throughout this process. Um, and I would end by saying that all of us really are moved to do what we're doing by personal. We have, some of us have real personal connections to the region. Um, uh, my father is Palestinian. My mother is Syrian. I was raised in Lebanon. Uh, and, and I know lots of people there, uh, including family. Uh, but for intellectual reasons as well, many of us have dedicated our lives precisely to these issues. And um, I think it was only a matter of time that we found each other here at Brown University. Okay, thank you. Just, just say your name, that's all. My name is Sarah Tobin. I'm somewhere between a potential parent and a parent, I guess. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to echo the thanks that Bashara offered, not only to the team for a lot of hard work and dedication, but also to Dima Amso, and in particular, the James S. McDonald Scholar Award in Understanding Human Cognition, which was the major funder of our trip to Jordan in January. Middle East Studies, the Brown Institute for Brain Sciences, congratulations, Diane, uh, as well as the Department of Cognitive Linguistics and Psychological Sciences. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the NGOs in Jordan that I have now been working with for over two years, uh, many of whom have now become close friends. And uh, I appreciate very much the hard work that the NGOs are doing, not only on the ground and in their everyday lives, but also the patience and the tolerance that they give us and extend to us as we sort of come in, try something out, try to work out a new question or a new idea, and then return to our home institutions as bearers of that knowledge. So thank you for trusting us, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to share your stories as well. In this talk, I'm going to give just a very quick overview of the Syrian refugee crisis, um, and specifically as it relates to the case of Jordan. Uh, to Brown University students who have now heard me do this for the last year and a half, uh, I hope that you continue to uh, come and show up and hear me continue to talk about this important topic. 
Before the conflict in Syria and the Civil War started, there were approximately 22 million people in the country. Since 2011, in particular within the last few years, uh, over 50% of them have been displaced. 6.6 .6 million Syrians are internally displaced. 4.5 million are refugees in neighboring Middle Eastern countries, which has been a very hot topic, particularly in this presidential election cycle. Nearly 1 million have applied for asylum in Europe and points beyond. This was uh, very much a topic that we explored last fall during the teach-in that we had in Middle East Studies. And by most counts, by Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, as well as a few other organizations, over 250,000 Syrians have been tortured and killed. While Turkey has taken in the most Syrian refugees of the Middle Eastern countries, the demographic impact of Syrian refugees has been the most pronounced in Lebanon, where one in five people are now a Syrian refugee. In Jordan, while official counts of registered refugees sit at approximately 650,000, many estimate that an additional 400,000 Syrians live in Jordan but are not registered with the UNHCR as refugees. The question of Syrian refugee children is one that captured our attention and we hope will continue to capture the attention of much of the world. Syrian refugee children comprise approximately 50% of Jordan's Syrian refugee population. That's approximately 300,000 people. As such, this demographic influx makes children in Jordan a particularly distinctive and important category to think about and to investigate. The 650,000 Syrian refugees in Jordan are spread throughout the country. A large portion of them live in Amman, the capital city, or points northward, closer to the Syrian border. It's believed that 85% of these Syrian refugees in Jordan, or over one half million Syrian refugees, live in Jordan's urban area. They comprise by far the largest demographic. There are six refugee camps in Jordan that house the approximately 15% um, minority of Syrian refugees that are encamped. They include um, Zatari, I don't have a pointer, so you'll have to just uh, look as I'm pointing them out. Uh, Zatari, with approximately currently 75,000, 80,000 people. Uh, at its peak, it had over 100,000 people. Azraq, which has 32,000 people in it. Marjiba Fahud, which is also known as the Emirati camp. It is, owned, or it is run, operated, paid for uh, by the Emirati government. Um, that has approximately 4,000 people in it. King Abdullah Park has 1,000 people in it. Um, and Cyber City, which is a camp for Palestinian refugees from Syria, uh, has approximately 300, 400 people. At its peak, it had just over 400, but the numbers are declining. And in fact, in all of the camps, or most of the camps, are declining uh, with outward immigration and more asylum seeking within Western countries. <laughs> The last camp is marked on this map as the Ramtha refugee camp. Um, from what I understand, it's now closed. Um, is that right? Yeah. Um, it's in the, nor in the northern city of Ramtha, um, this Jordanian city closest to the Syrian border. There was a gentleman from the Al Bashabsha family who cleared his compound, which was comprised of five different apartment buildings, allowing the refugees, the first Syrian refugees, to settle there by mutual agreement with the Jordanian Ministry of the Interior. The El Bashabsha Center, or Sakan El Bashabsha, is now considered uh, what was the first sort of refugee camp, or at least the first sort of uh, formal encampment recognized by the Jordanian Ministry of the Interior. So to hone in on Zatari for just a moment, it is uh, famously, or perhaps infamously, depending on which reports you read, the second largest refugee camp in the world, second only to Dadaab, uh, which is housing Somalian refugees. It's also now considered, roughly, the fourth largest Jordanian city. It grew very quickly. So if you take a look at this uh, series of maps, the top left image shows Zatari in November of 2012. The top right image shows the same place two months later in January of 2013. The bottom left image shows it yet one month later at the beginning of February 2013 and the bottom right image at the end of February 2013. That means that over the course of a few months, November to February, the camp grew exponentially. 
This is more or less what it looks like today. There are a few things to note on this map. Um, as I mentioned, it can house a capacity of approximately 100,000 people. The orange dots you see are housing structures, residential units, tents, or what are called caravans, which are mobile home units. Um, it's just a one sort of 10 by 10 sized room, uh, two windows and a door. In the top left-hand corner, where you see primary camp entrance, that's the main gate. This is the area by which Syrian refugees, uh, NGO workers, scholars, researchers, journalists uh, are all instructed to go in and out of. Following this main gate, just further southward, is the what is affectionately referred to as the Champs Elysees, uh, the uh, main market street. Uh, this, the Syrian refugees that initially came named it that, sort of in a joking manner, after the French hospital that was one of the very first service providers in the area. If you follow that down about halfway across the map and over towards the right, this is now what's referred to as Saudi Street. This is another market street. It is also home to as you might guess, services provided by the Saudi government. In the top left-hand corner near the primary camp entrance, you have the base camp for NGOs and UNHCR operations. Further to the right in this next sort of block of blue buildings uh, is where the Jordanian government has their base for operations. One other thing I'll point out is that the camp is not fenced in. However, in an effort to limit smuggling and to try to maintain some sense of order and some sense of um, control, the Jordanian government has built a trench, which is this dark circle that you can see. Unfortunately, I thought the a light, I have to just sort of point and hope you can see it on the map. Um, this dark trench that goes all the way around the outside. The trench is designed to keep young people, children, uh, and Adults as well from, for example, moving goods illegally in and out of the camp, trying to streamline everyone through the primary camp entrance. Nonetheless, the refugees are free to come and go, um, and they do have access to nearby services and towns. This is an aerial view of Zatari. As you can see, it's quite an expansive space. The land mass is about three kilometers squared. It is a mix of tents, which were the initial housing units set up by UNHCR, and caravans, as I mentioned. The two uh, streets that I mentioned, Champs-Élysées and the Saudi Street, which are streets for market practices, include shops like Safeway. Um, a Silicon Valley startup has recently also come in and tried to establish a, an accredited coding program uh, for students in higher education. A Dutch bicycle company has come in, but it's also home to and primarily home to over 3,000 shops that are run by the Syrian refugees themselves. In terms of the NGOs in the camp, um, they run a wide range and they are quite numerous. World Food Program, UNICEF, Save the Children, Questscope, NRC, IRC, IOM, a number of three letter acronym, uh, NGOs are practicing uh, every day uh, to benefit the lives of Syrians. And here's a map of where a number of the notable NGOs are placed throughout the camp. The NGOs provide a dizzying array of services from schooling and training, vocational or otherwise, food aid, first aid, health care, water and sanitation. Meanwhile, the Jordanian government is seeking to provide security, access and refugee protection. This recent map of Zatari here demonstrates the decentralized locations for the NGOs and their wide variety of services. And throughout the day, I'm very excited uh, that we have these great guests from the, several NGOs in Jordan um, who will be able to speak firsthand about their experiences providing these services. In conclusion, I would just like to add the rhetoric and the language around the Syrian crisis is often quite dramatic. You might have heard it referred to as the worst humanitarian crisis of our time. You might have heard uh, young people in particular referred to as a lost generation. Images of the Syrian refugee crisis in Jordan and points beyond are images of suffering. They're images of pain, of loss, and despair. All of those things are true. But it is also the case that there are images and people who stand for resilience, who stand for hope, who stand for a future that is promising and that is uh, one of 
our engagement, mutual engagement, global engagement, and working together to find common solutions to make those dreams a reality. So thank you very much. Tough act to follow. Um, I'm just going <laughs> to remain seated. I just have a three minute thing to say. So uh, I know <laughs> my name being one of them. So my name is Carl Saab. I'm a neuroscientist faculty member here at Brown University and Rhode Island Hospital. I'm also a member of the Brown Institute for Brain Science and president of the Society for Arab Neuroscientists. And you might be wondering why am I part of this group? with everything that you just saw. Is there anything that I can do? Is there a role for me to play in this? And like everybody else um, watching the refugee crisis unfold, I was constantly asking myself, well, how can I help? How can I be engaged? And here I'd like to echo what uh, Professor Dumani said. I really would like to give credit to Professor Amso for calling me up one day and saying, well, you can be engaged. You can be engaged as a scholar as a neuroscientist. So to give you a flavor about what I do, uh, my lab and others have shown that if pain, for example, is left untreated uh, for months or years, well, that has negative consequences on brain function, brain physiology, and it could also reduce the cell counts in your brains. And so the more I learned about stress, the more I was struck with the uh, similarities between what we call toxic stress and a state of a brain that's in constant pain. So it immediately made sense to me, and I thought, well, maybe I can be engaged after all. And so um, in my studies, to understand pain well, I had to listen closely to the patients, to the caregivers, and in this refugee crisis as well, I think we all agreed that, um, that we have to listen closely to the refugees, the NGOs, and also uh, the science experts who are here uh, with us today. Uh, so uh, I think that as a team, as, as Bashar has said, we are continuously evaluating our fundamental question, uh, which is uh, what kind of question are we asking, and really how can we uh, help, how can we be impactful uh, faced with this tremendous uh, atrocity and, and crisis. Um, and so, uh, while carefully framing the question uh, th that we might be asking within a regional context, because uh, this is the th some, some of the things that we learned from day one visiting the camp, uh, we're also aware um, that we're dealing with core issues here that are essentially humanitarian and universal that could be applied anywhere in the world in any crisis situation. At least this is what we hope to accomplish. Um, so with that, it's, it's very brief, but I'd like to thank the audience and welcome you to Providence and Brown. Thanks. Tuba, would you mind? This is a pointer if you need one. Okay, I just, does this work? Can you hear me? Awesome. Thank you all for being here. I'll try and keep it just as brief. <laughs> um, and thank you for the, the group for making me one of your own. It means a lot. Um, I just wanted to share with you guys today um, just some anecdotal experiences that I had on the trip and hopefully by doing so pose the question, um, what is life beyond mere survival? After going through the experience of this experiences of this trip, I would have to say that the strongest impression left on me was the importance of the human dimension. That there are needs of a child that exist beyond that of the immediate crisis. Let me start off by saying that this was not my first time working with refugees. Um, in 2012, as part of my time with the Red Cross, I'd worked in various Palestinian refugee camps. However, that did very little to prepare me for what I was to see in Jordan. Um, there, the situation was very different. The Syrian refugee crisis compared to that of the Palestinian, which has now lasted over 60 plus years, is one that is relatively new. Um, the the Zatari camp, which was only built as an emergency temporary dwelling for those Syrians escaping from the south, has now been only hosting Syrians for the last roughly five years. Um, and as simple as it is, if you don't mind, Tuba, going to the next slide, 
Um, even the physical layout of the two camps is striking. Uh, on the right, you will see a Palestinian refugee camp in Ramallah. And then on the left, the Zatari camp. Um, the cramped conditions, uh, bare sunlight, et cetera, it contrasts sharply with the sea of white caravans that you'll see here. Therefore, while the Palestinian refugee crisis has one that has become a permanent reality, this has yet to happen to the Syrians. Um, the sea Syrians have yet to give up hope. In fact, after talking to some, the caravans closest to the Syrian border were most preferred where they hoped to someday return. Thus, during the trip, the Palestinian refugee reality hung in the air, almost like a threat of what the future would bring to these Syrians. How long would it take until each NGO tent, one by one, would slowly disappear, and the Syrians, like the Palestinians, would become forgotten? Um, as you enter the Zatidi camp, you come upon what is called base camp. Sarah touched upon this before. This was the center of all NGO activity, and just as importantly, the only place with Wi-Fi. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see, in fact, every time you pass by base camp, you would be sure to see young boys crouched over their phones, leaning on the fence, trying to pick up on any of the Wi-Fi. The base camp was where many of our meetings with various NGOs were held. Amidst these many meetings, we quickly coined the term NGO speed dating due to caravan after caravan that we passed, all housing different organizations. This really helped me witness firsthand the limitations to humanitarian and NGO work. We met with a wide range of NGOs that differed greatly in types and qualities of services provided, the funders and governments that they were beholden to, as well as the goals and philosophies of approach. We heard little about what a refugee was before he or she became one, however. It was important as a group to better understand this question and the larger complexities of the situation. What was the daily living like in the camp, for example? And how is that different from their life before? Those at Zatsidi are now quickly realizing that this temporary situation has become more permanent and that there are needs that must be addressed beyond those of mere survival. Although Zatsidi has now moved beyond the humanitarian relief phase, and has started becoming a development project, this, had ma this has made the refugees a different kind of object, from one of victim to one that re needs reform and lacks empowerment. This circles us back to the importance of the human dimension, the social realities of the refugees, which cannot be ignored, especially now. Before any prescription, any recommendation, intervention can be made, we first have to be made aware of the social realities and differences and be cognizant of the fact that not every refugee crisis is the same. In doing this, we also acknowledge the agency and capacity that Sarah talked about that these refugees each possess. On our fourth day of the trip, we went to Cyber City, a small dorm-like camp for those doubly displaced, if you will, Palestinians who were expelled from their homes and fled to Syria, and then expelled once more as the war progressed. As I walked into Cyber City, the I noticed that the atmosphere was very different from that of Zatari camp. As you see up here, oh, do you mind just one going back one, sorry. As you see up here, you saw the pictures of the four girls. Um, these girls, no older than the age of six, quickly became very attached. Um, they would hold my hands, my jacket, stroke my hair, <laughs> ask me, repeatedly why I was there. They're, they were clearly excited to see a new face, a distraction, someone to talk to, and as we continued to interact, I noticed very vividly their need for human contact. When our visit came to a close, the girls pleaded and begged with me to take them with me. One girl mentioned that she wanted to go to France. Um, and asked me in Arabic, or um, when will you come back? It's my birthday on Thursday, will you be there? Against my better judgment, I promised that I would try and come back someday, even though I knew that the likelihood of this was remote. I couldn't help but wonder, how many times have false promises been made to them before? 
My experiences both inside and outside of the classroom at Brown University helped me prepare for this trip. The rigorous instruction that I received, the interactions with the student and faculty from all over the world, have taught me to be cognizant of my position of power and to respect that each situation is unique and different. The implications, if anything, meeting these girls really um, made me aware of the implications of my presence and my participation in the humanitarian work that I had already been so critical of. Brown has taught me to see things from a different viewpoint, to be critical of what I learn, and more importantly, to be critical of myself. I've come to be more open to learning and experiencing things that are outside of my comfort zone. When I started at Brown, I thought I knew everything, and now I know that that can be very limiting. So I'd like to end by saying that just yesterday, I received an email from a fellow student telling me that she had seen an article on the project in the news and wanted to know what she could do to become more involved. Uh, needless to say, it made my day. Uh, as a student myself, at many times, I've asked the same question. What can I do? I know that these girls will someday eventually realize that due to circumstances out of their control, they have been robbed of their future. So what will become of this lost generation, and what, if anything, can I do about it? In order to go beyond this white man's burden kind of discourse, I believe that the first step is always building a network of like-minded individuals, all passionate about the same thing. That's what Dima and Bashara did. That's what Sarah and Carl did. And that's what we're doing here today. And what I hope will continue after this conference. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tuba. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say anything nearly that interesting. <laughs> um, so, so thank you so much for being here. Actually, um, and thank you, Tala. That was really lovely. Um, what we're going to try to do is do a little bit of what you just saw, which is uh, present some of what's currently being done, the stressors, the humanitarian work, the humanities end of things, and then shift and talk about how the sciences may play a role in that. So my role is to serve to underline the purpose of today's event from the brain development and brain science perspective and highlight some of the issues that we're going to be grappling with throughout the next day and a half. Um, so, so to date, and to, to date, brain development research um, has had implications here at home for education, health, juvenile law, parenting practices, mental health approaches, and to alleviate concerns or at least to study and examine what it means to grow up in poverty with respect to um, academic outcomes, achievement outcomes, and, and brain health. And so, for example, my own research with my colleague David Better has addressed poverty and brain development in the state of Rhode Island. Working with Dr. Tirka, we've looked at um, cognitive um, outcomes of children who have had um, early trauma um, in their lives. That today, our goal is then to explore um, how chronic toxic stress pertains to the developmental profile of Syrian child refugees. And, and If I ask you for a moment to think about human development, um, you may intuitively imagine it as something like this, a super highway where the child begins in one place, let's see if I can, right? And somehow over some linear trajectory ends up someplace else. And um, people think about development intuitively in this, in this really interesting way. Um, and in order for this tr to be true, the trajectory is somehow insulated from the elements, is sort of separated from the experiences the child has. Kids grow up. 
Um, but, but realistically, actually, the road is never so smooth or insulated. Human development is much more variable and much more influenced by a landscape. So in the vast majority of cases, uh, you know, we all experience tumbles on our road but end up somehow in the same place. But depending on sort of the size of those boulders, you could end up someplace completely different. And that's where stress becomes really important and it becomes really important to understand the role of experience, um, human experience, both positive and negative, in how we're shaped and in, and in our outcomes. So if we stick with the idea of human brain and cognitive development, I think it, it becomes really critical throughout today and tomorrow for us to understand that the human brain is shaped by experience as it develops. Now we're all shaped by our experiences as, our, as adults, but they're less likely to become formative, lifelong um, parts of who we are as individuals when our system is more stable and we have these experiences, which places children in a really unique uh, circumstance when we think about um, something like the Syrian refugee crisis and, and when we think about the kinds of shaping experiences that they're having. Uh, my dad is here, so I'm going to say that he gave me this picture and he said, look, this is our home in Syria when we were little. So shaping experiences are really important. So what are these experiences? Well, look, they can be, the, this, and this is all scientifically based. I'm not putting a lot of references up here to keep it simple. But enriching experiences have been shown to support brain and cognitive development and child health and growth in the positive way. So things like supportive caregiving. Megan Gunner is here today, and she'll talk a lot about how that brain science has, uh, has learned about how important supportive caregiving is um, in child development. Having enriching materials in the home, stimulating materials, books, toys, are, it's really important to stimulate the system to learn and to grow and to engage. Education, peer relations and relationships that are even outside of the home environment. And depending on, on the child's age, for example, adolescence is a really important time to have strong positive peer relationships and proper nutrition. All are shaping the brain in the positive direction. Basic principles. We're not talking about, you know, going to Disney World here. We're talking about the things that a human needs to grow, the basic principles that a human needs to grow um, in a protected way. So what are the negative things that, that we've seen in the scientific community to have outcomes that um, are not so great? Well, stress and adversity, and I won't define stress for you because we have Bruce McEwen here who's going to do a great job of doing that. But caregiving deprivation um, is a stressor. Unpredictable environments, not knowing what's coming next is a stressor. Um, maltreatment and abuse, this is normally what people think of when they think of stressors. Nutritional insufficiency, poverty or a lack of those enriching materials, deprivation, um, and of course trauma and violence and experiencing and witnessing that. So you have these two sort of competing elements in every developmental cascade. It's not the case that there is a development that's free of stress or that there's one that's free of enrichment and adversity. In the end, it's sort of like a sort of a threshold issue. How far are you along one dimension or another? And what we, what I want to highlight for you is that this, the impact of stress and adversity on the developing brain has been extensively examined. And I'm not going through this slide in any detail, but we know that stress and adversity impact memory systems, emotion systems, and executive functions or behavioral regulation systems. These are the really critical components of educational attainment, of behavioral control, of flexible action, of being adaptive and flexible in your environment. And what's really beautiful, I think, about the brain science community in this domain is that the data have looked at behavior. We've looked at networks of brain regions. We know what the neuronal architecture might look like under some of these conditions from animal models, all the way down to the molecular structure. So this is an area that I think actually has something to say about what is happening to the system when a child is growing up in adversity, right? And so when you're hitting these, these systems, when you're hitting these brain regions, what really is happening is that you're disrupting processes 
behavioral processes that, as a mom, I want to see nurtured in my child. I want to see him have empathy and theory of mind. I want to see him have cognitive flexibility. I didn't put these exclamation points there, but I kind of like them. Um, <laughs> they work, but I didn't put them there, just so you know. Um, effective learning and memory, control over behavior, communication and language, and reasoning. These are at the core of what we want to see in a productive society, in children growing up. Um, this is what every school wants to see. This is what every parent wants to see. And so to have uh, early life stress hit systems in the brain that then translate into impaired development is something that we can't take for granted. It's something that we have to think about very, very seriously as a global community. And, and this meeting is addressing a really big humanitarian concern, but I want to say, you know, a lot of the work that, uh, that all of us have done um, has been local. So a lot of my work has been right here in Rhode Island, and we face some of the same issues here in Rhode Island, um, and we think about some of the same issues here in Rhode Island and locally, and, and we don't take that for granted for one moment. So, so now these brain disruptions are impacting development, and in doing that, stress confers risk for pathologies later on. Anxiety, depression, learning disability, aggression, ADHD, PTSD, schizophrenia. Uh, Kevin Bath will talk tomorrow a little bit about anxiety and depression and the role of early life stress, not in immediate development of anxiety and depression, but what happens later. You don't see it right away, but it's there and it's forming the system, and you can pretty much expect that this is a population that's going to be at risk for these problems later. Audrey Tierka will also discuss some of these issues. So a lot is happening here, and what we hope to do, and, and you know, it's not the case that I think everything is gonna be accomplished in, in one phase or in one process or in one year, but I, I think it's a lot of work, and um, one of my favorite quotes of all time is Kennedy saying, well, let us begin. But can we harness the power of cognitive and brain development research to further manufacture resilience in Syrian refugee children? Why do I use the word further? Because there are amazing people on the ground doing amazing work. And if we can be of service to them by bringing our science to bear on what they're doing, then that's a further service. That's an action item. That's something that we can do, right? And what's been really beautiful about this is that any time this team has approached scientists or in the community, I emailed Megan, I said, Megan, I need you to help me out with this. She said, well, I teach on Friday, but I will cancel it and I will come. Because everybody wants to do something. Everybody wants to be engaged in the global community. Everybody wants to use their talents and their services. And so I think here, with respect to the children and, 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 and specifically their developmental profile, there's a, a really nice synergy between the humanities, knowing the context of the families, the culture, um, knowing all of the wonderful work that's being done by UNICEF and the NGOs, and then combining that with the brain science data and coming somewhere in the middle, something more collaborative than any of us can do, that then has hopefully um, positive impact moving forward in the future. Keeping in mind a couple of things that you're gonna hear today. You're gonna hear about developmental timing, and development timing is everything. So why am I saying that? Because I, when you hear the term sensitive period, I want you to remember that if you have a stressor in an infant, what the infant brain is doing is it's, it's, it's building its sensory systems. So those sensory systems are going to be more impacted by that stressor. In the same household and the same stressful circumstance, there may be a five-year-old who is building cognitive control. That same stressor is going to hit that cognitive control system. So whatever is developing is what's going to be impacted. And that's something to keep in mind, that we're not dealing with uh, you know, a static, you know, when you have stress, you impact this process. You have to think about where the child is in their developmental profile. And the reason that that's important is that you then understand what they're at risk to develop, and then you understand where you should be putting your intervention time and money. So developmental timing is everything. We have windows for risk and resilience. Regional susceptibility, you know, uh, this idea of brain development, it's a complete misnomer. There's no such thing as brain development. There are a million different ways in which uh, you can ask questions about what's changing and developing. And again, keeping an eye on where a child is in their developmental profile and linking that with the experiences that they're having is gonna be very, very meaningful moving forward. So. What are the kinds of things that might help 
you know, that's why the experts are here, and I don't want to presuppose knowing anything about that. But the brain science community actually has shown that, for example, under conditions of extreme stress or adversity, that you have a court response, a cortisol response. Megan will tell you all about this. Um, but that you can buffer that with social, maternal caregiving, differences in peer relations, cardiovascular activity, perceived control over your environment, high-fat diets, sleep patterns, environmental enrichment. So taking the biology and combining that with the psychology and the psychosocial, um, psychosocial uh, um, interventions, I think, could be a really useful approach. It's one idea. We should be open to anything that comes out of this meeting. And so with that, I'm going to say thank you, and I hope that today is about dissemination of knowledge, but also synthesis of information, and especially thank the Jordan team, um, who's been amazing, the wonderful speakers who came from, you know, all the way from Jordan in some cases, and Minnesota and New York and others, and, and thank you all for um, being here. I think right now we have a brief uh, inter like we have a brief break. Grab some coffee well, and well, well, we have oh. A Q and a for oh, we have Q and A. Yeah. <laughs> if um, you have if you have any questions, we, we did an excellent job of keeping within our time frame, precisely because we're interested in what you might ask us. So we do have a few minutes for that before we take a break, and then we'll start the next panel with President Paxson and Bruce McEwen. There's a, a microphone here that can. There's be microphones in hand, so there's microphones on either side. versus the uh, situations at uh, Zatari, mm -hmm. um, but you never articulated, other than with the picture, that difference. Um, can you say a little more like about, about sort of, because you, you were talking there about the social realities among the Palestinians you'd worked with earlier, and I, ge I guess in right. Jordan as well. Right. Yeah, of course. Um, so I, there was a theme of, um, something of a, lo a long time frame versus a short time frame. So the Palestinian refugee situation has become more of a permanent reality in the sense that uh, when you go to the Zatari camp, it's still very much a center of focus for NGOs, for different governments. Um, at the same time, when you go to Palestinian quote unquote refugee camps, those have become permanent dwellings. And uh, you know, and I'm not qualified enough to talk about um, the psychology of it, but from my own pure, purely my own observations of speaking to Palestinian refugees, uh, not there's not much hope of return. Not that there is none, but there's not. And um, the daily living, the the daily stress is different from a lot of the daily stress you see. I saw personally at the Zatari camp, in the sense that as a Palestinian living in a refugee camp, your reality is very much different from one of this is a temporary situation. How can I support my family from this day to the next day? Versus um, uh, this is a more of a permanent situation. Um, I don't see much hope of leaving this camp anymore. This is not a camp. This has become a community. How can we better um, structure leadership in this community, et cetera, versus in the Zatari camp? Um, hopefully that answered your question, and maybe anyone else um, on the panel would like to chip in. One, one more. You, you did it in the context of little girls, too, right? mm -hmm. and you talked about the little girls bonding with you right. No, no, no. Um, no, no, I would say at both camps. I mean, it's always interesting when you have, uh, part of my point was um, as a foreigner coming into the camp, um, coming and leaving, right? Uh, uh, it's, um, you have to be cognizant of your positionality, of your participation. Of course, when I go in, even into the Palestinian camps, um, girls are very interested. Um, children are very interested, they want to hold my phone, etc. Um, that's not necessarily the difference, um, but I was actually speaking to, and Dima touched upon this very well in her presentation, the need for peer relationships, for human engagement, and I found that even the difference between Cyber City and Zatari was striking, in that um, a lot of the refugee children were a lot more approachable and almost needed 
needed this kind of distraction, needed some kind of, um, you know, when you're living with under 400 people, you see the same faces every day, um, your, your daily life and reality is very different from that of living in the Zatari camp. And for them, it was almost, if I can go as far as to say, their need for vitamin C. Um, and uh, Dima touched upon that in terms of wh just what a child needs, and I touched upon that in the sense that it's, um, it's beyond mere survival. It's beyond more life and death. A child needs something beyond the immediate crisis, and this was one example of that. Thank you to everyone. This is really an amazing, moving, and intellectually challenging synthesis all at once. Um, really can't say enough about that, but my question is actually very basic and it's to the scientists. Uh, if, if brain development is not the right term, what is the proper, I really want to know so that when talking about these issues in class as a non-scientist, uh, what do we call all of this in terms of the impact on children, the physiological impact? If you could just give us some more guidance on t how to talk about this in a nuanced way. Thank you. Um, I mean, brain development is an okay term. Uh, I think that's fine. <laughs> what, I was, what I was referring to is rather um, the idea that, that there are, you know, you've a, you're dealing with a very complex organ. It is, it is actually an organ. I think a lot of times people don't remember that when we're dealing with mental health, we really are dealing with a biological system. Um, at its most basic level. And so there are different parts to that system. So when you engage with a child, you know that you don't ask a three-year-old to do complex mathematics because they're not there. And that has an underlying architecture and structure. But they are capable, for example, of uh, you know, doing very simple problem-solving tasks. So what I was referring to is rather uh, that the idea that there are different parts of the brain that develop at different times, and that being cognizant of that um, might allow us to um, be, be a little bit more thoughtful about shaping interventions. So what, how you might intervene with an adolescent would, and I think you know, there's, a, there's an intuition there, but would be very different than what you would do when you intervene with a five-year-old, even though they are both at a time where they have extreme need for peer relationships, for example. Uh, so it, it's rather to just sort of bring home that there's no such thing as the brain doesn't just kind of go up and down in this sort of uniform way, that there are different systems and that bringing some of that to bear could have a positive impact um, here when we go into the school system and we talk with educators or, um, or in Jordan when we're thinking about you know, the interventions for kids in the camps. All right, um, quick question. I'm not sure who to ask this to, um, but you guys quickly mentioned that um, there is limited internet connectivity. Um, and I feel like a lot of the problems could be resolved um, by improving that. I know this is easier said than done, um, but I'm wondering if there are a lot of efforts to do that because I'm assuming this can help with communication, assimilation with the rest, rest of the world, um, sense of community, um, even sense of uh, the human touch through um, web. So I'm wondering if a lot of funds are being dedicated to that. Or not. Um, well, I think the issue is exactly the opposite. Uh, there's a real concern to limit that because they don't want the refugees to be in charge of their own future, really. So l internet is limited by design. Uh, most refugees stay in touch with their relatives and their friends in Syria, but also across the camp in many other camps in uh, different countries in the region through WhatsApp or WhatsApp. WhatsApp, daddy. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is probably the most used along with Viber uh, for direct communication. Uh, and they depend on it so badly. And any time the internet is cut off from the, from the camp, and that happens on a regular basis, uh, they feel it. They feel it very, very strongly. Uh, they suddenly feel that, that they are really in a prison. Um, so um, 
I don't think that it's a technical issue. I think it's a political issue. I'll say just funny sort of anecdote. I um, I was so happy at one point we had met with uh, through Questcope and Kurt Rhodes is is here and he'll talk a little bit about Questcope. But uh, we had met with some uh, some volunteers who are refugees and uh, I met with a mom who was from. Uh, you know, I, I was having a very nice conversation with a mom and who had a kid about the same age and etc. And uh, and as I was leaving, I would, it, you know, it just grabs you because you're in the middle of a refugee camp in Jordan. She goes, "Are you on Facebook?" I'm like, <laughs> "Yes, I am actually." <laughs> um, but it, you know, you're right. There there is that need for human connection and sort of that maintenance, especially when you're in an uncertain situation and don't have a lot of, you know, when you meet somebody, you don't know if you're ever going to see them again. Um, but it, for a variety of reasons, these, there there are different limitations there. Can I just add quickly that? Um, a large number of the refugees do have smartphones, and 3G, 4G is available. Um, and so, I, I mean, whether or not Wi-Fi is on um, is only one part of the question. Um, the fact is that if you have a smartphone and you have uh, enough dinars to buy a few giga data, um, then you have access to the internet. And so actually, um, the literature and the work on refugee migration into Europe has been very clear that the use of the internet has been extensive in terms of informing refugees about pathways that are open and pathways that are closed. And so this is where we saw in the evolution of pathways through Europe, um, through the Balkan states in particular, you know, it would be open one day and close the next, but how do refugees know? Well, they know because they're messaging each other and telling each other. And so, you know, you get on a boat from Turkey to Greece, you got to make sure that your, you know, smartphone is waterproofed and protected because that is the way to connect once you get across the water. Um, so, I mean, I, I think the, the technological question is a really important one, um, but I'm not sure that it's also a panacea to solve these, these issues. I, I have a question, sorry. I was late, so I'm sorry if this has been dealt with, but it's about brain development, and maybe it will be taken up later, but it has to do with resilience and how you yourself factor in resilience with brain development, that a child coming from the same stressor, nonetheless one succeeds maybe and another doesn't, and if you go there with resilience. I know it's... Well, uh, so the good news is I just verify that Dr. Megan Gunner will go there. Um, but uh, <laughs> but I do th I do think I think um, I think a frustrating thing about this situation is that no one has control over the stressors that these kids have experienced or maybe will experience in in a, a large scale way, right? So no one certainly you know, knows what's going to happen next in their, in their situation. So then where do you put your energy? Well, you put your energy into supporting the things that are going to make them cope better. And there are means to support resilience and brain development. And some of them, I think, are coping strategies. And others um, may be things like, and I've had, you know, it sounds so simple, but if you can change their sleeping patterns, if you can support activity that's cardiovascular, if you can do those basic things that um, can be woven in with the psychosocial support, then I think you can actually probably support resilience. Now, We'll see. It's, it's, it's an empirical question. But at least the data that we currently have suggests that there are a variety of ways to biologically support resilience. And then the psychosocial factors are so important, maternal buffering, caregiving practices, supporting the parents, supporting the families, building community, social engagement. I mean, we're social. We're a very social species. And all of those things, I think, are really critical to supporting resilience and brain development. So, so I have a lot of hope that resilience is very much possible. I just want to stress that although sometimes we may speak in science and you know use um, uh, scientific jargon, uh, we don't necessarily want to go down the route of pharmaceuticals or you know uh, providing pills for anybody. Uh, I want to give an example from the pain fields. For example, there are people who suffer from phantom pain. These are people with amputated limbs who suffer from pain in their limb that doesn't exist. And so there's a trick to do that. There's actually mirror therapy that works like magic. 
you train the patient to use their other hand in, in the face of the mirror and relieve that tension and pain goes away. I can give you another example. For example, we were at the camp. I started a soccer game and I think it made wonders for the kids and they were just, you know, so excited. very excited for about half an hour. And then I got myself in trouble with the security guards. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are many ways that you can be creative um, in how you call resilience. I think we'll be able to take only one more question. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for all these presentations. And I like the interdisciplinary aspect of them combining, uh, you, know, you know, all the work that uh, you have presented. Uh, I'm looking at this and I'm reflecting some of my own work where we uh, work with, you know, animal models, subject them to stress early in life, uh, and then come back in middle life or at the end of life and look at uh, changes uh, in their brain. Um, and that's more like environmental exposure stresses. Uh, and we have looked at um, uh, epigenetics. We have drawn some of the very first epigenetic maps of the brain in response to environmental exposures. So I'm wondering, you know, maybe we will talk during the break. You know, there are biomarkers you might be able to track if there is blood samples from those epigenetic modifiers. You know, and we have maps for them across the lifespan from our animal models. So there might be some you can measure them and we can see them, you know, that early life experience can permanently change these in the lifespan of an animal, whether it's a rodent or a primate, uh, and whether intervention in the future could change them. So there's really maybe some interesting aspects to follow with biomarkers of epigenetic uh, biomarkers across the lifespan. Thanks. I'll take that as a comment, and may I make a quick one myself before we wrap up, because we have to take a break. Um, <coughs> I just want to once again thank Brown University for bringing together this incredible set of faculty and students. Uh, you can just tell from what we each presented that <coughs> we are <coughs> in a way uh, bringing multidimensional perspectives into a single question. Uh, I'm struck by the word of the use experience over and over again by both scientists and the humanities and social scientists. In fact at Brown the the, the definition of the humanities is the human experience. And <clears throat> I'm uh, also very struck by how many people have come to us throughout this project saying we do this part, we do that part, uh, how can we bring our work to interface with yours, and that has been really, really amazing. So I want to thank you all uh, for coming so early to this first panel. We'll take a quick break and then we'll resume. Thank you. Thank you.